Okay, I uh, hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce Austin. Say hi. hi. Austin will be your Langdale Scholar this semester. Uh, he was in my class twice, right? Prop one, prop two. Property one and property two, so he knows my stuff very well. Uh, I hope you can attend. You want to tell them when the first session is going to be? Yeah, tomorrow, 345 to 445 in room 513. It should stay that way. Tony will send out an email if not. Okay. Anyone have any questions? No? All right. Thanks, Austin. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions or anything in your mind? No? Okay. We can start. Um, I want to ask a question to bridge our lesson from last class to this class. <clears throat> and this is your question. Is the following a valid inter vivos conveyance? Painting from dad to dad for his life then to dad's son and his heirs. I know this will not make any sense to you, but you should be able to answer this based on the case we did last class, Gruen versus Gruen. So is this a valid inter vivos conveyance? All right. All right, now let's take this one step at a time. Again, I know this question, Ezra, will not make any sense to you, but hopefully by the end of class, we'll be able to understand it. All right, who's, uh, who's next? All right, Corey, so let's start with the easy question. What is an inter vivos conveyance or inter vivos gift? Uh, gift given life. Okay, what is the opposite, Corey, of an inter vivos gift? Uh, testamentary gift. Okay. What does that mean, testamentary gift? Okay, very good. Now, uh, Carson, what's the major difference between a testamentary gift and inter vivos gift? What's the, the deciding difference between those two? Well, that's true, that's true. But those are the requirements of a testamentary gift. What's the basic difference between a gift inter vivos and a gift that's testamentary? The, the basic difference. Why is one treated one way and the other treated the other way? One's validated with death and the other one's with, you can give it during life. Okay, now you said give it during life. What exactly are you giving during life? Some sort of interest. Uh, interest, so Troy, let me ask you a question. Think back to the case we did last class, right? Gruen versus Gruen. Involved the painting, right? Did the father actually give the son the painting during the father's life? No. No, where did the painting hang all those years? Ah. But what did the father give to the son during the father's life? Uh huh. But what exactly did he give his son? What did the court hold that he gave his son during his life? You can go back and check your notes if you need. That's okay. What exactly, and this is important, what exactly did the father give to the son during the father's life? Is that uh, Samir? He gave the son a present interest. That's correct. But I thought we just said a minute ago that the painting continued to hang on the wall of the father's home. 
You were right the first time. Troy, you want to try it? What exactly did the father give the son during the father's life? I don't think it's life, but um, it's not clear life state, right? No. That, no, no, that that's not right. You're you're in the ballpark, Elisa. What exactly did the father give to the son during his life? This this is important that we phrase this. I think Samia was right the first time, and she kind of got scared off her answer. Yeah. What exactly did he give? But what's a remainder? You're right, but what's a remainder? It's a future interest. Okay, what's a future interest? Okay, so you, you're, you're really close, all right? Presley, let me, you're next, right? Okay, let me ask you this question, Presley. The father gave the son what's called a remainder, okay? A remainder is a future interest. What that means is after the father dies, the son owns the painting. I think we all agree on that much. But Presley, here's the million dollar question. I thought the definition of inter vivos conveyance is you have to give an interest now. Would giving a future interest in that letter be considered inter vivos? That's the question. You see the question? Yeah. Is giving a remainder, a future interest in that letter, is that an inter vivos conveyance? Tell me why. Wouldn't it be testamentary if Dixon after he dies? Yes, but um, if you look at the will that was written, then it would yeah. still be in Jesus. Kelly, what do you think? Do you think giving the present interest in that letter is inter vivos or testamentary? Uh, inter vivos. Tell me why. Yes, exactly correct. Perfectly said. You can give a future interest in the present. That just screws with people's heads. I know. Well, I know it's like, what are you talking about? Just, just hang with me for a second, okay? The letter that the father gave to the son was conveying him an interest today. That's an interview that was conveying. You're getting an interest today. But the interest does not kick in. It has no actual tangible value until the father dies. You have that interest floating around throughout the entirety of the father's life. It's not worth a penny until the father dies. What this tells you is you can have a future interest in the present that kicks in sometime down the road. I want to understand what I just said. If you understand that, this class will be a lot easier. If you don't, it's going to be hard, right? John Carlo, I'm going to repeat it also, but John Carlo, please ask your question. When you say no tangible value until the father dies, he doesn't have the painting. I thought you could sell also. You can, but I mean, he doesn't have the painting, right? The painting keeps hanging in the father's home. Isn't the interest worth the value? When I say tangible, I mean you actually have the painting, right? The painting hangs in the father's home. Right? You don't get the painting. All you have is basically like a promise that when the father dies, it's yours. But it's more than a promise because a promise can be broken. This is your guarantee. right? Someone mentioned a will earlier. Allison, after the father wrote this letter to the son, could the father have put in his will that he leave the painting to his wife? Why not? <laughs> Bingo. It's permanent. Once the father conveyed that remainder to the son, the father no longer had that remainder to do anything with. It wasn't his anymore. All the father retained for himself is what's called a life estate. This is what Troy, I think, mentioned a couple minutes ago. right? The father kept for himself what's called a life estate, meaning I had this painting, all the sticks in the bundle, but I'm going to chop it up. I'm going to keep one stick for myself, which is a life estate, and I'll keep another stick for my son in the future, which is called the remainder. 
Once you separate that bundle of sticks, the father can't bring it back together. They belong to different people, each stick in the bundle. So the answer to this question is yes. Let's see how you guys did. Uh, oh, pretty good, 75, 74%, that's not bad. It doesn't have to 100, but close enough, right? Um, this is a valid inter vivos conveyance, but the reason why is very important. The reason why is very important. To have an inter vivos conveyance, you have to convey an interest now. Did the father convey an interest now? He did. But the interest, but the interest he conveyed was a future interest, which is fine. Think of the opposite, right? Do you remember the case involving? Um, uh, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Imagine a different case, right? Where the father tells the son, you know what, son, I really love you, and I'm going to give you this after I die, uh, but I reclaim the right to take it back, right? Meaning, you can have this when I die, but I can come and keep it anytime. Maybe I'll give it to someone else. That wouldn't work. The reason why this works is a father relinquished any interest he had in the painting after his death. He can no longer give it to anyone else. If one gets that much, right? You convey the future interest in the present. Therefore, it's valid inter vivos conveyance. Yes, uh, uh, Julissa. So like in wills, how you can write someone out of the family completely. Say if he gave it to the son, but then wanted to take it back, can you sue for it in that scenario? Well, let, let, me, let me answer your question, right? A will is a testamentary document, right? Wills only kick in after a person dies. Until you're dead, a will can be revoked at any time, right? Let's say you write a will today to your son, and maybe your son dies, right? You can then rip up the will, write a new one. Until your will goes through what's known as a probate process, right? Until your will is actually finalized, it doesn't matter what's in it. Indeed, your will may be, de may be deemed invalid. Maybe you didn't have the right signatures. Maybe you didn't have witnesses who signed it, for example, right? What does that mean? Any gift that you say only goes into effect after you die, their interest is conveyed later, is going to be testamentary. But if you're giving interest now, it's inter vivos. And once you give it, you can't get it back. Right? So I think Jaleesa's question is this. Could the father have sued the son to recover the painting? On what ground? It wasn't his anymore. Right? Once the father wrote that letter, he relinquished that future interest in the painting. It's not his anymore. The father can just keep it for life. What's that control? I'll get to you. There was a recent example of a life estate that was actually quite famous. Um, Hugh Hefner, right, the, the Playboy uh, guy, right? Um, he lived in the Playboy Mansion, but he was getting quite old and he needed some money. So what did he do? He sold the, the, the Playboy Mansion, but he didn't sell it entirely. What he did was he said, okay, when I die, you get the house, but I can stay in it for my life. In other words, Hefner said, I will keep a life estate for myself, it gives some wealthy investor the, the remainder. So when Hefner died, all the bunnies had to move out, right? And the other guy would now have the house in the entirety. That way Hefner was like, okay, I'm dead. I don't care anymore, right? Okay. Troy, sure, I think your hand was up a minute ago. Uh, hmm. <coughs> sure, the son could sell it, but there's an obligation to make that transaction. Right? You can always pay someone money to do something, but they're not, not <laughs> obligated to do it. Is that hand? The remainder. The son, there, the son can go to an auction house and say, look, my father's getting kind of old, getting a little sick. I'll sell you this remainder. When he dies, you can put up for auction before the father dies. You can do that. That was my question. If it, if it didn't kick in until the dad died, how You can sell, and I'm going to caveat this. There are, there are certain exceptions. But as a general matter, you can sell a future interest. We'll do the exceptions later. I don't want to kill you with it now. But you can sell a future interest. Yeah. Ah, uh, well. That's a good question, right? So let's look at what I actually wrote here, right? Let's just go analyze this language one step at a time. So it says painting from dad to dad for his life. What the hell is that? Josh, why would anyone write that sentence in the English language? Like, like, why would anyone write that? Kelsey, help me out here. What, just that first stuff before the comma, right? And I'll get to a Bar a Garrett's question in a minute. Kelsey says painting from dad to dad for his life. What the heck is that? I don't know. Well, but my assumption would be that if he's giving 
like I, I'm thinking about it in like chunks almost. So like Go a ahead. future interest is like a chunk. Yeah. So he's giving about sticks himself instead of chunks. Okay. <laughs> stick. Good. He's Good. giving Good. himself Good. the stick of his life estate. Yes, that's exactly right. Sticks, not chunks, sticks, right? Um, <laughs> the, the father owned the entire bundle of sticks. He had the painting, it was his. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna take the painting and chop it up. Now you're not actually gonna take a, a chainsaw to the painting, right? That's not what's going on here. It, remember that commercial where a guy was getting divorced, he's chopped everything in half with a chainsaw, right? That's not what we're doing here, right? There's no chainsaw. But he's saying the painting belongs to dad, but he's giving himself just a life estate. He's basically carving up his interest chopping it up and saying, you know what? I had everything, I had the full bundle of sticks. I'll give myself a life estate. And then the comma, right? Uh, uh, oh, Yancey, thank you. What comes after the comma? Painting from dad to dad for his life, that's a life estate. Comma, pay close attention to the punctuation in this class, please, it matters. Comma, then to dad's son and his heirs. What's going on there after the comma? And, okay, this was Garrett's question for a minute ago, right? So, yeah, see, father dies, where does the painting go? Okay, what happens if the son died before the father? Who's heirs? Whoa, 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 whoa. Just, who, who's heirs? We're talking. Yeah, the son's heirs, right? Which, which might be the grandchildren, might not be. You can designate in your will who your heirs are. Right? Your heirs do not have to be your biological children. In fact, maybe you don't have any children. Right? Maybe you don't have any brothers or sisters. People have different situations, right? So you can designate your heirs whoever you want to be. Right? Heirs are determined at death. Right? If you're alive, you don't have any heirs, thank God, right? I don't have any heirs. But when I die, heirs will count as I live. So this is language that is going to seem very foreign to you. It's language that's going to seem very uh, bizarre to you, but you're gonna have to learn to speak it, right? What this sort of language is accomplishing is conveying both a present interest and a future interest, right? This language conveys a present interest and a future interest. What's happening here, the father starts here owning everything. If you wanna use a language of fee simple, we'll get there later, but the father had a fee simple interest and he carved it up he gave himself a future, I'm sorry, he gave himself a life estate, which is a present interest. The father gave himself a life estate, which is a present interest. The father also handed out to his son a future interest, what's known as remainder, right? And you have this pairing, right? A life estate followed by a remainder, okay? In almost every case, when you have a life estate, it has a pair. The present interest is called life estate, it's going to almost always be followed by a remainder. I'm hedging a little bit because it gets complicated, but for now, life estate, remainder. Okay? Make sure you start getting track of these terminology. Uh, there are going to be a lot of different kinds of future interests and present interests. You're going to have a really long list in your notes by the end of this topic. A very long table that you're going to want to murder and rip into many shreds. But for now, it's easy. When you have a life estate, it's followed by a remainder. Lexi. So you have a who, who, who? Yes. So the so son. The son in this case would have a present interest in the remainder. Don't, don't, don't say present interest. He has, at present, a future interest. Right? If you start saying he has a present interest and a future interest, you're going to kill you. You're going to go crazy. Okay. So say today, right? At the present, the son has a future interest. Or you can say he presently has a future interest. Don't say he, he has a present interest and a future interest. You're going to, like, <laughs> It's not wrong. What you're saying is not wrong. It's, it, it's, it's actually correct. But um, I'm going to discourage you from saying that because you'll confuse yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, Chance. Does the dad need to designate, say, so the painting of Ethan Wayne, does him need to designate that piece of land as a life estate first before? Yes. Can... Yes. So prior to it's always in that sequence, and you first take care of the present interest. And then once you have the present interest divided up, you figure out who gets the future interest. So what does that process actually look like? Is there, like a, is there a document? That, that's it, that's it, that'll do it. What I just wrote in the board will do it. Okay, and then also. These are magic words. Does 
the dad, after designating the son the future interest, right. have any obligation to maintain the <sighs> Never right. Worry about that uh, well, the, the short answer is, is is possibly right. So imagine that um, you you're the son, and you realize that your father starts like you know destroying the property and like treating it really poorly. There are some cases where courts will intervene and ensure that the present life they holder doesn't engage in what's called waste. There's an entire doctrine called waste, which I'm not going to teach you, but but you should at least be familiar with it. The person with the life estate, if he engages in what's called waste and destroys the property, a court could actually enjoin it and halt it for the benefit of the future interest holder. What's called the remainderman, which sounds like a, you know an action hero, but it's not very exciting. But here, the son's called the remainderman, right? The remainder man, right? It, uh, but he he's coming along eventually, right? He's just waiting for his dad to die. I know it sounds gruesome, but that's exactly what's going on. And once daddy dies, then it's his, and he makes millions. Okay. Questions? Yeah, get Garrett. No, 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 no. These are gifts, right? These are all by definition gifts. There's no consideration. Um, you need a writing. Um, you don't need witnesses, but you need a writing. And the writing could just be this, to satisfy the statute of frauds, right? Uh, but you do not need consideration. This is, these are not contracts in the, in the traditional sense. Yeah, uh, Ricardo. Um, in regards to this specific situation on the board, it says then to dad, son, and his heirs, can the remainder then be conveyed to someone else, like by the son? Yes. So technically, I guess. The son can, in his lifetime, convey it to whomever he wishes. Even though it's it's his and his heirs. Ah, what does this phrase "and his heirs" mean? Like, is the, is the remainder divided amongst the son and then oh, his no, no, heirs no. as well? So, well, what makes this, see I put in bold under uh, an underline, right? Why did I do that? What makes this topic so much fun is that words have meanings, right? And let me just, I'll answer your question. I have some other stuff I want to do first, but let me answer your question now. When you see the phrase, and his heirs. That doesn't literally mean the son and his heirs. No, that'd be too simple, wouldn't it? The phrase, and his heirs, signifies what's known as a fee simple. I'm going to explain later what that means, but I didn't want to leave Ricardo hanging, right? Words don't mean what they actually mean in this class, right? You're going to have to memorize some stuff, right? You have to memorize some stuff. And because Ricardo asked, I will describe it, right? So initially, the father had a fee simple in the painting. This won't make sense, but I wanted to give it to you now. The father carved out a life estate from his fee simple. And the son has a remainder in fee simple. I know that makes no sense to you. But I want you to see what's going on here. You start off with a fee simple, the full bundle of sticks. These are all the sticks in the bundle. The father carves out a life estate. The son has a remainder. What happens when daddy dies? The sticks come back together. The son now has fee simple, right? The, the full bundle of sticks are always floating around, right? You can't destroy a stick or a chunk, or whatever you want to call it, right? The sticks are always there. They just belong to different people. In this case, when Daddy Dearest dies, the son reclaims the entire bundle of sticks and gets fee simple. So, Ricardo, to answer your question briefly, the phrase, and his heirs, does not actually mean the heirs of the son. It means a son has a remainder in fee simple, which he can convey to anyone he wishes. I'm going to explain this really well in a minute, but yeah. So because right now the son doesn't have the complete fee simple, he cannot, can, so he can't take out a life estate from his remainder. So if his dad's still alive. Oh, God. Still alive. You're, you're, you're asking a question. The short answer is yes, but I don't want to tell you why. 
<laughs> you can chop these things up like a, like a jinsu knife, right? Any which way you want, you can chop these up. You can do life estates for anything. Even if you don't have the full sequence? You can do life estates for whatever you have. Okay. Right? I'm telling you, you can get so creative with these things, which is which one of the reasons why they're so complicated. <coughs> now, let me, let me take a step back. Why the hell do we have this, right? Isn't this really complicated? Why on earth was this system created? And the short answer is no one actually created this. It's not like someone sat down and said, you know what? This would be a really intelligible, logical way of managing property. Let's do this, right? The topic that we're covering now, what are called estates, evolved over the course of hundreds of years. Not like five years, not 10 years, not 20 years, not 50 years, hundred, I'm talking like four or 500 years, right? Our constitution is barely 200 years old. This stuff developed over hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, there's a quote in your book from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who you will sure read about at some point this, this uh, year. And he says, it is revolting to have no better reason for a rule than it was laid down in the time of Henry IV during the 1500s. It is still more revolting if the grounds by which it was laid down have vanished long since, and the rule simply persists through imitation of the past. This class is imitation of the past, right? We are merely doing things the way they were done during the medieval times. Um, it is complicated, it is messy, and it's not straightforward, but you have to learn it. Uh, there's no other way. But I'll try to make it as easy as I can. Um, let me give you a brief summary of how this entire system came about. It began nearly a thousand years ago. Can you imagine a thousand years? A thousand years ago, during the Norman Conquest, right? This was when the English and the French idea started to merge. And a system of society came around that was known as feudalism. Feudalism. Um, you may have studied this at some point in your education, but if you haven't, that's fine. I'll presume you, you don't know anything, which is usually how it... When, when I teach common law, I presume you know nothing about American history. I just presume it's a lot safer. Um, it, it's a safe assumption. Most people don't learn civics anymore. It's unfortunate. Um, but a system developed known as feudalism. And the basis of the system was a hierarchy. At the very top was the king, the sovereign. The sovereign, the king, owned all the land in the realm, right? He owned all the property. Private ownership was not permissible. But the king would allow certain nobles to have land. These lands were called fiefs, like a fiefdom, you may have heard that phrase, a fief. Indeed, the word fee simple, fee relates to fief. These are all words that we followed over hundreds of years. And so certain nobles, certain, certain wealthy aristocrats were given access to land. But they were, they were not going <laughs> to toil the land themselves. Instead, they needed people to provide service for them. And the service took a few different forms. One, you had knights. Think of like, you know, medieval times, right? Um, the knights were people who provided protection. They would fight wars. They would... Uh, 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 get rid of people trying to conquer them. There was also religious service, right? You had the priests and the clerics who provide spiritual service. And then you had the people at the sort of bottom rung of the pyramid who were known as the serfs or peasants or villains, if you will. It's not an evil word, but that's what they were called. And the villains would farm the land. They would take care of the livestock. They do all the things needed to make the estate work. All right, so how did this work? Money, we think of like cash, right? Money wasn't really a thing back then. It didn't really exist the way it does today. Instead, you owed service, right? So what would happen? The king may say, um, I need knights to go fight a war, right? At that point, the nobles would send their knights to fight for the king. 
And the serfs, the peasants, said, I need a place to live. So the, 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 the nobles would say, you can live on our land in exchange for farming it. Okay? But what happened when people died? Um, what would happen to that land? Well, initially, when a person died, their family and kids would be kicked off. There was nothing they can do about it. But that might seem a little bit unfair. So over time, a system of inheritance formed, where usually it was the firstborn male would inherit their father's interest. Was it all, well, Josh, what if the only daughters? It sucked, right? There was nothing that could be done. In fact, you had a famous king, Henry VIII, who was so desperate for a female heir, he killed a couple of his wives. They kept, they kept popping out females, right? He wanted a male heir. Didn't get one. And it was his fault, right? It was his chromosome he wasn't giving. But um, <laughs> this is a really big deal. And the doctrine is known as primogenitor. Um, uh, let me, it's a hard word to spell, and I always spell it wrong. Primogenitor, which basically means the firstborn male inherits. Primo first, genitor born, right? So the firstborn male would inherit. Um, and this system, you know, worked for several hundred years, but then it got complicated. Okay, why did it get complicated? Because some of the knights thought that they were royal, and they wanted to have their own types of serfs. So instead of having this neat pyramid with like you know three or four layers, you would have an, like a, a, another layer put between the knights and the vassals. Like, aha, you are my serf. And you have another layer and another layer. And before you knew it, you had you know, hundreds of interlocking layers. And then the king realized that these people were screwing him over, right? It's not just the nobles beneath him who are collecting all the revenue. It's these other intermediary layers. So the, so the English government said, aha, we have an idea. Every time land is transferred, we're going to tax it, right? We're going to impose a tax on all these what were called sub-infudations. Don't need to know the word. But all these, in, these, these rungs that were added. Just don't, you know, don't write it down. But just know that there were, the government tried to tax all these little transactions. So then people said, aha, I have a way to get around this tax. By the way, tax evasion versus tax avoidance. You know these phrases? Tax evasion, no good. Tax avoidance, smart, right? <laughs> You'll learn this very well next term. Uh, there's nothing wrong with tax avoidance, just tax evasion is a problem. Uh, so tax avoidance was popular back then. And lawyers who existed during this time figured out ways to avoid the taxation based on transactions. They created the elaborate conveyances that said, I will own this land for my life, and then when I die, it goes to my son. Sound familiar? Sounds familiar, right? Why is that significant? Because there's no conveyance after death to tax. There's only one conveyance. See what I just said, right? If I say, I own this land today, conveyance number one, and when I die, it goes to my son, that's conveyance number two. You're getting double taxed. Versus, I have a conveyance now. I own this land for my life, and my son gets when I die. There's only one conveyance of tax. So the government gets us money. Do you understand why you have this thing like the father did? He did it to avoid taxes. Even remember he said that in his letter, right? The same crap from middle, the Middle Ages is being done today. Nothing has changed in 500 years, which is why I love property. Unlike Conlow, it changes every five seconds. Property just never changes. It's like, how do we avoid paying taxes? It's the same thing, whether you're in the 1500s or the 2000s. OK. So you develop this elaborate system to avoid taxes. And the entire premise was, how can we control today how land is transferred in the future, right? How can we write a conveyance today that will deal with future occurrences? Right? That was the goal, right? How do we figure out today what's going to be tomorrow. And it's very difficult. I mean, think of it just from this perspective, right? Uh, you know, you know who's alive today. Maybe you have your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your husband, wife, son, daughter. Uh, but most of you don't know about maybe grandkids that might be born or great grandkids that might be born. Or maybe there'll be a war that happens that screws things up. How do you forecast what will happen in the future? That was their mission. 
And they did it by tying up land in family bloodlines, right? Where the same family would basically keep ownership of a property for year after year. But what if you have a no good grandson who says, you know what, screw this, I want to become an artist. And he says he wants to sell all the land, right? How can you control your ancestors? I'm sorry, your, your, your not ancestors is the wrong word, your, your future descendants, right? How do you control your descendants to make them not able to sell your land? That was the goal of this enterprise. That's why you had life estates. It says, okay, you can have it when, you, when, you, when you're alive, but when you die, someone else gets it. And when they die, someone else gets it. You prevent your kids from handing the land to someone else because they only have it for their life. It basically stays in the bloodline. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. If I don't watch a show, but Downton Abbey, I know it's a big deal, right? It was how to. Uh, I can't watch, whatever. but it's how to. I should watch. It's about property, but I can't. It's like how do you keep property inside of a bloodline, right? How do you do this legally? Okay. All right, everyone with me. All right. That's the basic history. The book has a very long discussion. I don't care if you actually know that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's useful to have, but uh, I go back and forth on assigning it, but I usually do assign it because if you don't give it to you, it won't make any sense. But my abbreviated version is just as good. OK? All right. So when you start thinking about the topic of, 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 of estates, um, there are two questions that I want you to think about over and over again. Um, the first question is, who owns it? And the second question is, when do they own it? So the first question is, who owns it? And the second question is, when do they own it? Uh, yeah. You said that they would do this in order to keep the land in their bloodline. I'm summarizing grossly, but generally, yes. But once the father died, if the son gained both, if he, if he got all of it, couldn't he just give, sell that to someone else? Too? Depending how they structured it, he may not be able to sell it to anyone. Oh. Right? That was the entire point. You know, say, for example, you had a son who was a drunk, and the father knew the first one son was a drunk. He could do it that the son would only have it for his life and could not convey it anywhere else. Anyway, that's right. Yeah, you could basically skip a generation, right? So, you know, let's say the Queen Elizabeth thought that her son was a jerk, wants to go right to you know Prince William, right? You, you could do stuff like that. Uh, anyway, royal family keeps shrinking, I suppose. Um, so you have two questions, right? Who owns it and when do they own it? So think of the painting example we have earlier, right? Who owns it? When do they own it? So the father. Does he have an interest in the painting? Yes, he has a life estate. The son, does he have an interest in the painting? Yes, but he has a future interest that's remainder, right? So the same painting, right, the same physical object has an owner that's a future interest and has an owner that's a present interest, right? The word owns, O-W-N-S, is not very helpful in this class. Right, if you just say, I own the painting, the follow-up question is when, right? What's your interest, is it future interest or present interest? So, <coughs> excuse me, you really need these two questions, both of them. If you just raise your hand and say, Josh, you know, the son owns the painting, I'm, I'll say that's half right, when, right? You have, to, you have to do both of them. You can see how this gets tricky, right? You gotta do both of these questions. And if you follow me on this one, it'll be a lot easier. If you don't, you'll get left behind very quickly. All right, everyone with me. Okay, one last note. Um, I showed you the video in the last class with the livery of season, or the twiggle, right? Twiggle. Um, it's mentioned in the book here. I prefer to mention it early. I think it makes a little bit more sense. But the livery of season was this ritual where you would have a ceremony to show that you're conveying the land. And this may not be done once. You may do this every single year, right? to signify that there's this ongoing relationship between one party and another, right? That this physical act of delivery 
is the best evidence of a conveyance. Careful with me. Is that a hand? No. Okay. All right. So let's start. Um, in your notes, you should start keeping a list of the different types of interests. It's going to start off easy here, but I think we'll have about a dozen of them by the time we're done. There are a lot of them. There are a lot. Okay, the first one is called the fee simple or the fee simple absolute. Um, the terms are synonymous. I generally say fee simple. You might see in a, a book somewhere fee simple absolute. They're the same thing. Um, I don't use the word absolute for reasons I'll explain later because I think it creates confusions down the road. But if you want to say absolute, I won't stop you. Okay? All right. The phrase fee simple, right? When you hear the phrase fee simple, I want you to think of the full bundle of sticks, right? When you have a fee simple interest, you have the full bundle of sticks. That is, you have both the present interest and you have the future interest, right? When you have fee simple, you have the present interest and the future interest. The reason why some people call it fee simple absolute is that it's an absolute interest. You have everything, your present and future. So if you want to use absolute, that's fine. I suggest you don't, but, but you'll see it in some books like that. Okay, what does that mean? Well, think of the painting, right? Initially, the father had the entire bundle of sticks in the painting. He had a fee simple interest in the painting. He had access to both the present interest and the future interest. But what did the father do? He broke his bundle apart. He gave himself a life estate, that's a present interest. And he gave to the son the future interest, that's the remainder, right? When you have a fee simple interest, you can do whatever you want to it. You can chop it up every which way. Chop, 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 right? Any which way you want, you can chop it up. You can give yourself a life estate. You can give someone else a life estate. You can give your son a remainder, right? You can give remainder to whoever you want. You can chop things up. Okay? Be simple is easy. Very easy. Okay. Now, everyone with me, right? Now, how do you convey a fee simple? You have to pay attention here. There's no way to, you gotta memorize this, right? I'm going to write a sentence on the board that's gonna make you roll your eyes, but I'm gonna write it. From O to A and his heirs. From O to A and his heirs. What the heck is that? All right, so we'll walk through this one word at a time. O, who's O? Owner, I prefer original, right? Right, but O is the original grantor, right? The original owner, okay? At the outset of this equation, right, O had a fee simple, right? I didn't tell you that, but you have to understand that. You have to infer that. When I write from O, that means O has a fee simple. I can't tell you why, but in this class at least, if I say from O to A, you should presume that O has a fee simple. Now, maybe the facts are different. Maybe I tell you he doesn't. I can do that. But if I just write from O, you have to know that O had a fee simple. He had the full bundle of sticks. Okay? That's number one. Then number two, from O to A and his heirs. From O to A and his heirs. So O had a fee simple. We have this language, A and his heirs. 
This was, I think, uh, Garrett's question a few minutes ago. When you see the language and his heirs, that means fee simple, right? When you see the language and his heirs, that means a fee simple. What this sentence means is that O is giving his fee simple to A, right? O is giving his fee simple to A. Now it's not A and his heirs, right? Literally, because your heirs aren't determined until you die. You can choose your heirs whomever you wish. What this language means is that O had a fee simple, and O gives his fee simple to A. Everyone with me. Now, what happens when um, Bryce? What happens when A dies here? Uh, goes, to goes to A's heirs, right? Unless, Unless he gave it to somebody else. during. His life. That's right. Very good. A now has a fee simple. A can convey his fee simple to someone else, or. A can do nothing. And if A does nothing at A's death, the land goes to A's heirs. Okay. Now, a couple of you asked about wills, right? Wills are fairly modern documents. When I'm asking you a question, presume there's no will, right? We're, we're in the Middle Ages, my friends. There's no wills in the Middle Ages. These people were illiterate. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. That's why they did the leafs and the puffs and the farts, right? You like that part, right? They were illiterate, they, they, they couldn't read or write, so they had to operate on much simpler bases. Their heirs would inherit. Um, and at common law, the heir was the firstborn male. That was it, you couldn't designate anyone else. That's not the, that's not the case any longer, right? That, that was, primogenitor was abolished in the United States in the 1780s, give or take, 1790s, depending what, what count you use. But heirs meant basically your firstborn male. But during life, A could convey Blackacre, or A can convey the, um, I said Blackacre. You'll learn this phrase. In property, every piece of land is called Blackacre or Whiteacre, right? It's like John Doe or Jane Doe, right? Why is every piece of land called Blackacre and Whiteacre? We don't really know. Um, there's some theories that Black acre refers to black beans and white acre refers to white beans. We don't really even know. But whenever I talk to you about a fictional piece of land, it's gonna be called black acre or white acre. Or green acre or red acre, or whatever else. But it's always black acre, okay? But when a person dies, if they haven't conveyed the land, the fee simple goes to their heirs. Okay. Now, Christopher, let me ask you a follow-up. Once A has a fee simple in his family line, will it ever be taken away from them? In other words, once A has a fee simple, and it goes to his heirs, and then that person's heirs, and the great grandkids, and the great grandkids, right? Does that property ever get taken away from them? Under the old feudal system or in general? Under the old feudal system? Yeah. Once you have a fee simple in your family, it can stay there forever. Unless one of your ingrate grandkids decides to sell it and become an artist in Paris or something, right? Uh, the fee simple is very powerful. It would go on forever and ever and ever. All right. So when you see this phrase, to A and his heirs, I'm sorry, from O to A and his heirs, you know what it means. I'm going to throw another wrinkle at you. Sometimes you'll see this. Instead of from O to A and his heirs, you'll just say this, to A and his heirs. These have the same meaning. Let's do that one more time. There's not a single way 
to write out these conveyances. You can write these conveyances out in many different ways. Say, Josh, how do I remember all them? I'm sorry, you have to remember them. There's no other way. They're magic words. If I say to A and his heirs, or from O to A and his heirs, it has different meaning. I'm, I'm sorry, same. It has the same meaning, I'm sorry. Different words, in this case, have the same meaning. Thank, thank you, Jay, for correcting me. Let's try a different one. Try this. From O to A for life. From O to A for life. Okay, so uh, Doug, let's walk through this one one at a time. From O to A for life. Okay. At the outset, right before the transaction is commenced, describe the interests of Black Acre. <coughs> Let's just take this one step at a time, right? O started off with a fee simple. That is, he had the full bundle of sticks. O gave A a life estate, which is a present interest. Okay? O gave A a life estate. Dylan, help me out here. We know that A has a life estate. That's the... Um, that's the present interest. Who has the future interest? Yeah. Oh, the plaintiff. Who's all that? Bingo. The future interest has to belong somewhere. Right? O has the future interest, which we call here. It's not exactly a remainder, but you'll say future interest. I don't want to I don't want to give you the wrong word, right? But O has a future interest here. Don't worry about don't, don't matter what you call it. Well there's a name for it that will confuse you. But O has a future interest here. After A dies, Dylan, where does the land go? It goes back to O. Okay. It's not called a remainder. I don't want you to write that in your notes, but it, it operates like a remainder. The words here get very messy. Yeah, Adam. Was that strictly just because uh, at the end it says for life? If it weren't to say for life, it was just from O to A, then? All right, so I didn't want to give you this, but you asked, so I'm going to give it to you. Um, I hate this, but it, it's, it's a thing, right? If I just write from O to A, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. I won't put this to you on an exam because I think it's unfair. But it, it's in your book, so I'll mention it. Um, if it just says from O to A with nothing more, right, there's a division of authorities on what that means. OK? If I just write from O to A without more, some sources say that's a life estate. 
and some source to say that's a fee simple. I am not going to give that to you, so don't worry about it. But just I want you to be aware. There's division of authorities on this. Is that yeah. is that enough for what you need to know? Yeah. Right. S some will say that this conveys a life estate only. Some will say that this conveys a fee simple. Um, I will always use the words either and as heirs or for life, and that that's. There are a lot of things that I can trick you on. This is not one of them, right? I, I, I can make your lives very difficult in other ways I think are fair. This one, I think it's unfair way to make your life difficult. I don't want to make your lives difficult, but this is not an easy topic. Questions? Yeah, uh, Nick. So for, for Ode, for life. Period. OK, for life. OK, good. I like that for question. Um, for whose life? Oh, so such a good life. question. In this question, it's A's life, okay. but it doesn't have to be. So, if you retain a life estate and you give a remainder of a future interest to someone else, can you assign your present interest to somebody else for the length of their life? Yes, yours? you so can. We'll do that next stuff. class. Okay. It's very. You can. That's next class. By the way, no class on Thursday. If you're here, I won't be here. Uh, so it will be on Tuesday, but Nick, that, that's exactly what we'll cover in the next class. A life estate can be measured by different lives. It can be measured by A's life. It can be measured by O's life. It can be measured by B's life. You can measure a life by anyone. You can measure a life by someone I've been born yet. Right? You, you can say, uh, uh, until the queen dies, right? Uh, uh, th that, that, th there were conveyances like that. Or, or you know, until the queen's great-granddaughter dies, right? You can, you can measure it on a life of someone who maybe is not born yet. Yeah, Jay. Could you distinguish uh, poor life from until death, or is the I don't think I'll ever use the word until death. For life is good. No, use the words I give you. Don't use other words. So when you say that O has future interest, you mean he has interest upon A's death? He has the interest today. The interest you have today is called a future interest. This was the, I think it was, uh, was it Allison or, or Haley, one of them said, said it correctly, right? At present moment, you have a future interest. So then your future interest kicks in. Your future interest exists today, but it doesn't actually kick in until the person dies, right? You don't, you don't, let me say it differently. Your future interest doesn't become a present interest until the person dies, right? Because when, when the person dies, your future interest becomes a present interest. You have it now. Okay, so then. What if O dies while A had the interest, and then does it go back to O's, O's heirs? O's heirs. Yeah, O's heirs step into it. O's heirs. Right? And in fact, if you want to be really precise, it would look like this. From O and his heirs to A and his heirs. Right? I don't want to torment you, but this is basically what your question is asking, right? You would ask, you'd say from O and his heirs to A and his heirs, meaning if for whatever reason A, I'm sorry, O dies at some point, his heirs get it. Or you could say from O and his heirs to A for life, right? This clarifies that if O dies first, it goes back to O's heirs upon A's death. Uh, I don't know who's first, Anthony, then Chance. Those last two sentences you wrote mean the same thing? No. No, they no. don't. Okay. What's the difference between the two of them? The second, or the last one that you wrote is only applied to A's life. And what about the first one? It applies to... What does this phrase, and his heirs, mean? To A... I, I. Someone said it. Yeah. When you, that means that A is getting a fee simple. Okay, so this is the question since love to ask me, right? What if someone dies with no heirs? Okay. In my class, everyone has heirs. Okay. And an heir doesn't have to be a son or a daughter. It could be a cousin. It could be an aunt. It could be an uncle. Some blood relative. Right? Everyone has heirs. Now, there are exceptions, right? I, there was this one case a couple of years ago where you had a Holocaust survivor whose family was entirely wiped out. He never married, never had kids. He had literally no one when he died. He was quite wealthy. 
and the state spent a lot of time trying to track down. And always, oh, uncle, right, people come out of the woodworks to get the inheritance money, right? But generally, everyone has heirs. There are exam questions where I've asked before, like there was a, you know, a mass pandemic where everyone dies, right? Maybe then in that case, there's no heirs, okay? If a person has no heirs and the state can't find any heirs, you have a process called a sheet. E S C H E A T, a sheet. Right? A sheet means if a person has no heirs at all, they cannot be found anywhere in the world, whatever the person's uh, wealth is, property goes to the state. Right? The state will take ownership of whatever assets the person has. Um, that's it. Right? But that's rare. I will promise you, I am like. If your answer in the exam is a sheet, you're probably wrong, right? <laughs> Students love this concept, like, oh, it's so easy, Josh. I don't do the hard work. It goes to the state. Isn't that easy? You're wrong, right? Um, unless the question's like, everyone in the world dies, and there's one person left, or something like that, a sheet is not the answer. Like, I, every year people put this, they think they're so smart, it's really not. Um, Allison. Which, that, like, always be something that can be said to the yes, when you see this language, from Owen, and, from Owen is heirs, oh, I'm walking, from Owen is heirs to A for life, you're presuming the measuring life is A. Okay. And why you're presuming that, it's the only life mentioned. Right? See, I'm going to get myself in trouble. But you could say, from O and his heirs to A for the life of B. Oh, I just messed with you. See what I did there? You asked for it. I'm sorry. But you can do that. You can say, hey, A, you can keep it until B dies. And when B dies, it goes back to O. You don't have to, but you can do that. Or you can make it for O's life. Right? You can live here as long as I'm alive, and after I die, someone else gets it. Right? But you see what's going on here. They're trying to control property. Because when you have what's called a life estate, it's not very useful to you. Well, I think of it this way. If I own a life estate, I own it so long as I die, and until I die, right? Will anyone buy property from me with a life estate? No. No, why not? Because once I die, it's gone. It goes back to, oh. So a life estate makes property very hard to sell. It locks it up. Because no one in their right mind will buy a life estate. Because they might lose it the second the person dies. You know, you buy it today, they can't buy a car tomorrow, right? No one's going to buy a life to save for you. It's not, it's not worth the money it's written on. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Because you can get in a car accident tomorrow and die. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. In this one, this first one, O is giving present and future interest away. He retains nothing. In the, in the second one, O does retain a future interest. In this third one, O also retains a future interest. Uh, Grayson and then Marcos. So saying uh, O and his heirs uh, to A and his heirs is saying that saying O to A and his heirs. Yes, and that, that's what I was trying to say before. You don't need this language, right? I, I gave that to clarify, I think, for, for, for Marissa a minute ago. But if you just said from O to A and his heirs, that, that tells you that O has fee simple, right? It's presumed that O has fee simple. It's presumed that O has heirs. You don't need to say it. I'm giving that just for you for now to make it easier. But in the future, I'm just going to say from O to A and his uh, from O-Day for life, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Do you have a question? Oh, good. Go ahead. Doug. From O to A, from O to Heirs to A for life to B and his heirs. Oh, God. What are you doing here? <laughs> Say it again. From O and his heirs to A for life to B and his heirs. Um, all right. I'll tell you what. I'll give you an easy one. Go to page 258. There's a question that's not... That's, that's in the ballpark of what Doug just asked. 
All right, problem number one, which I was going to get to in a minute, but I'll do I'll do it now. Uh, all right, uh, who who's next? Uh, I think uh, you're next, right? You want to read for me, uh, please, uh, problem number one uh, on page fifty-eight. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, but I don't care about 1600. Just just uh, get that out of the way. Uh, this question is asking about how the law existed 500 years ago. Um, I'm an originalist, but not that much, right? Uh, things were messier back then, so I'm only concerned about the present day in this question. So forget 1600. We'll just focus on the, the present day. So this is similar to what Doug asked, right? It says, O conveys black acre to A for life, then to B forever. Now, let me... Let me just copy this and put it here so we have it in our list of things we're thinking about, right? O conveys black acre to A for life, then to B forever. Let's say a little differently. We say from O to A for life, then to B forever. Okay? From O to A for life, then to B forever. Okay, so Alan, let's walk through this one step at a time. At the outset, what estate does O have? That's the very beginning. Uh, what what's O's estate at the outset of this question? How would we describe it? When I'm asking what is his estate, what am I asking for? What are those two questions I still have to think about? So two questions. Okay, so we have black acre here, right? At the outset, who owns it and when do they own it? Black acre. At the very beginning of this question. At the very beginning, I would say A is just conveying to A for life. Who's conveying it? Oh. Which one is it? Who's conveying it? A or O? Is it both of them? A. Oh, who's conveying it? Oh, A. Okay, so before the conveyance, right? O owns it. How do we describe O's interest in the property? What, 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 what kind of estate does he have? We've only learned one time so far. Yes, we do. It's conveyance. For, forget, forget the conveyance. Before this was even written, right? The day before this was written, what is O's interest in Black Acre? What do we call his interest? Tell me in terms of sticks, right? What, what, six, what, what are the two sticks we're talking about here? The two kinds of sticks here. Yes, exactly. You're exactly right. At the outset of this question, O has a fee symbol. He has the entire bundle of sticks. He has both the present interest in Black Acre and the future interest in Black Acre. He has both of them. I want to see that. All right, so J left. So then we say O has fee simple. And then we see that O conveys black acre to A for life, comma. We're just going to stop there for a second, right? From O to A for life, comma. And, and this is just a useful tip for you. Whenever you see a comma, just stop. Stop reading at that point, because I, I will use my commas very deliberately. If there's a comma, that means you stop. Jayla, from O to A for life, comma, we're going to stop right there. What did O do to his fee symbol? What did he do to his fee symbol? <coughs> he had a fee symbol, what did he do to it? He conveyed it to A. Did he convey the fee symbol? Um, no, he gave A a, a life estate. What does that do to the life estate? You had a life estate, so you had, you had a fee symbol, and you convey a life estate. What, what's, the, what's the significance of that act? What are you doing to your fee symbol, to your bundle of sticks? You were um, breaking it. Yes. You were breaking apart the bundle of sticks. And you gave a present interest, a life estate, to? A. Exactly right. O had a fee symbol, the entire bundle of sticks. He broke it apart. 
he gave the present interest a life estate to A. Okay, uh, I think Tony, you're next. Tony, what happens when A dies? Okay, very good. B gets the remainder. Okay? B gets the remainder. How do you know that? Because A has died and B gets what A has. Mm, not, not what A had. You were so close to the end. What? Tony, try this again. From O to A for life, B comma. B Okay, so from O day for life, the present interest is a life estate. You always have to have both present interests and future interests. You can't have them dissolve. Who has a future interest in Black Acre here? Okay, and what do we call that future interest? The life estate, or the remainder. Okay, very good, that's right. Let's, let's try this one at a time. You have a bundle of stakes. You have the present interest and future interest. In this question, A gets the present interest of the life estate. B gets the future interest, which is called a remainder. remainder right? A gets the life estate, the present interest. B gets the remainder, the future interest. You always have to account for both the present and the future interests. Right? They have to belong somewhere, right? You cannot have a piece of land that has no future interest. Someone, somewhere down the road, has to step into it, right? And this is how you screw up your exam, right? I'll ask you to identify all the present and future interests in a given piece of property. If you only tell me the present interest, you get half credit. And you're going to do it. I know you're going to do it, right? Or I can just say, describe the estate. This is my question to Alan a minute ago, right? Describe the estate of Blackacre. What I'm asking with that question is, what are the present interests and what are the future interests? If you only give me one of them, you get half credit. All right. So A has a life estate and B has a remainder. <coughs> okay. Now Heather, let me ask you a follow-up question. It says to be forever, right? Will B live forever? Does anyone live forever? Of course not, right? Heather, what happens when B dies? Um, I was just <coughs> guessing, but I'm assuming it's like a similar way, or like a different way of saying to be and to live. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And in fact, in your book, where it says um, to be forever, uh, just cross that out in your book and write to be in his heirs. Just in your book where it says be, to be forever, in your notes, just cross it right to be in his heirs. You're not just guessing, you're, you're exactly, maybe you were guessing, but you, 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 guess, you guess well. Um, this phrase forever is a synonym for end his heirs. I'm not gonna use forever, I think it's stupid. I don't even know why they put this in the book, I think it's confusing. Uh, but when you see that language like forever, which you might see in other books, I don't know, maybe you'll see it. Just know that that concerns end his heirs. Okay, thank you. Um, so what does that mean? Let's describe this in words, right? So O had a fee simple. O gave A a life estate, which is a present interest. And O gave B a remainder, which is a future interest. Okay? But I'm going to modify this in a way that will make you angry. O gave B a remainder in, Heather, fill in the blank. What kind of remainder is it? You said it a minute ago. Uh, just say it. I know you don't want to, but just say it. You said it a minute ago. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. What does and his heirs mean? Oh, I was like, uh, fee simple. It's a remainder in fee simple. Oh, Josh, what did you do? Right? <laughs> You're describing the nature of the remainder. It's remainder in fee simple, right? That is when A dies, B now has fee simple. It's a remainder in, which I know it's been, why would I write that? That's how you write, I'm sorry. A remainder in fee simple. 
you don't need to have remainder in fee simple. This was Anthony's question a minute ago, which I dodged, but you asked me this question a few minutes ago. All right. What if I said like this, from O to A for life, then to B for life? Oops. From O to A for life, then to B for life. You can do that. And Clayton, in this case, what's the present interest here, and what's the future interest here with this example? Okay, well, one at a time. A and the present interest called a? Uh, yeah. Present interest is uh, life estate. Very good. Present interest, A, and life estate. What is B's interest? Uh, a remainder in blank. Is it a remainder in fee simple? No. No, Tim, you shake your head. <laughs> Not A's life estate. Oh, no. mm -mm. Not A. Whose life measures the remainder? Well, because it only consists. Oh, yeah. Okay. The remainder life Yeah, very good. I'm going to write this out for you. I know this is complicated. O had a fee simple. O gave A a life estate, which is a present interest, whoops, life estate, right? And that's measured by A's life, right? O gave B a remainder in life estate, which is a future interest, which is measured by B's life. Oh. You see what's going on here. Now you got this button? No, no, no. The difference between number one and number two, right? Compare them. This was to be forever, or be in his heirs. This is to be for life. You can stack one remainder after another. Yeah, she's exactly right. You're nailing this. You're exactly right. What happens when B dies? It goes back to O. Oh my God, you're ready for this. Yeah, you can have multiple future interests stacked, one after the other. One second, Tim. But I want to just, I, everyone understand what happens. When B dies, right? When B dies, it goes back to O. Exactly right, in this one. You always have to account for all the future interests. Someone always gets it. If B's gonna die, everyone's mortal, right? Everyone dies, goes back to O. I wanna see that, very good, Heather. Yeah, you have a chance. So when A dies, B becomes the present <coughs> member, which means O has a future interest. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this terminology and all this stuff only works with actual people, right? Uh, I don't think so. Like you have corporation. Uh, you can you you can do that. In fact, we'll do trust later this semester. You you can leave it to a non-natural person. Yeah. So if you leave a can you leave a life estate to a non-natural person? Uh, you'd have to measure by someone else's life, but yes. Okay. We'll we'll do we'll do cases where <coughs> property is conveyed to corporations based on the lives of other people. Right, you can say, I give you know this business a, a black acre so long as I'm alive, and when I die, it goes to someone else. You can do that. Okay, so you have a couple hands. Uh, one, two, and three. So if A dies, B has the present interest. I'm sorry? If A dies, B has the present interest. Okay, so this example, when A dies, B then has a present interest in life estate. And then the future interest shifts to us. Yeah, and don't say shifts. Um, you're not wrong, but there's something called shifting remainders, which will just screw your head, right? So, so don't say shift and don't say revert, right? Just say it goes back. I know this doesn't make sense, but there, there, there are things called reversions and shifting interests that are completely different. So the words here are very precise. I'm trying to be as careful as I can with, with all of you. Marissa. Yes. 
Yes. But there are multiple people with future interests, right? B has B has a remainder, and O also has a future interest on top of it. Uh, I think Danny hands up. Yeah, um, I think it might be the same thing, but I'm asking about A. So B dies, O's future interest goes back to him. I'm sorry. Let me let me. Sure, I, I want to make sure I copy this because I think this actually work well for next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I I do these questions every year, and every year I do them a little bit differently. Um, but this I think actually worked well. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, um, Dana. So B dies, O's future interest goes back to O. Yeah. Very good. A, a, A's dead. Isn't A dead? Wait, no, 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 no. A's alive. Okay, A's alive. B dies. Okay, so. Your interest goes back to O. Does no, uh, um. <laughs> All right, so her, her, let me, let me, I want to repeat her question. I think it's a good one. All right, so you're, you're asking what happens if B dies first? Yes. So when A dies, there is no B. Right. Uh, it goes so. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> well, did you see? In this question, right? If B dies, right? So A dies, I'm sorry, A is alive and B dies. Mm -hmm. When A dies, we check, is B there? B is no longer there, it goes back to O. No, I'm Try it again. Okay, only B dies. <laughs> well, when does B die? Um, before A dies. Right, so B dies before A. So A still has present. A keeps it until he dies. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. Right, but 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 your question I thought was a little bit different, right? If A is alive, and while A is alive, B dies, okay? B will never get it once once B is dead. Yes. All right, everybody dies. <laughs> Everyone's dead. You go to O's heirs. Everything goes. If O is dead, then it goes to O's heirs. That's correct. <laughs> Everyone's dead. All right. Uh, 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 Tim, then Chance. Oh, would it be improper to say if you had a remainder in blanks? I could say a remainder. In who? Or like in, I wanted to say in A, why did you say if A was still alive? I mean, do you not do that? No. Say somebody who life to say. No, because it's not. It's not that wouldn't be correct. It's life to say. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's his life to say, but not someone else's. Chance. Yes. Okay. And that's exactly what this question illustrates. O and B, O and B simultaneously have future interest in Black Acre. Can you get it to A and B at the same time? Yes. You can do a joint life estate. Right? So uh, imagine you have a husband and wife, and you say, I give this for your joint lives. And whoever lives the longest gets to keep it. So you can do a joint life estate. We'll do life estates next class. Anthony. So B dies first, then A dies first, then O gets his future. Yes. That was Diana's question as well. The answer is yes. And if that made no sense, welcome to this class. I, that's okay. Of course, the answer is yes, right? Uh, all right. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I'll summarize in a minute, but I want to make sure I get all of your questions first. Yeah, Doug. In this example, A can give his interest to someone else, as, as per, but that interest only lasts for his life. No matter what A does, once A dies, goes to B or O. Right? This is a sub imputation thing where you basically start chopping up your own interest in different ways. Tim? Right, so there's no such thing as having somebody else, a remainder in somebody else's life estate. Uh, you can do that also. That's not what this is, but you can uh, do that. Because if you added just like men to C for life, you would have. Oh, God. Sense. But then you would have two sentences that say, O gave B a remainder in life. Look, o gave C a look let, let, me, let, me, let me answer your question and summarize a little bit because I can see people are getting frustrated. Um, you can do whatever the hell you want, right? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. And there are some rules to limit what you can do, but there are not many rules. Um, you had some very uh, 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 smart lawyers back in the Middle Ages who created these very um, complicated instruments to try to control how land was used after death. And sometimes the courts upheld them, 
and sometimes the court said these are not enforceable. But if a court upheld it, then everyone used that same language. Right? So a lot of the language you see is because some court in the 1600s said, yeah, that's good language, I like that. Right? And use the same damn you know, language 100 years later. Right? All right, but let me, let me try to summarize this and, and make this as digestible as possible, because I know there's a lot of things here. Um, when we're talking about ownership of Black Acre, we think of these two concepts. We think of who owns it and when do they own it. Right? You always have to account for the sticks in the bundle. They have both the present interest and the future interest. You have to account for both of them. If you're looking at a question and you can say, ah, oh, I know who has it now, but I don't know who has it in the future, you're only answering half the question. You have to account for both sets of interests. Okay? If O has a fee simple, he has both the present and the future interests. He can chop them up. He can keep a future interest from, I'm sorry, he can keep a present interest for himself, give a future interest to A. Or he can give A the present interest and give B the future interest. Or he can give himself the future interest and give someone else the present interest. He can do whatever he wants. And whether everyone dies, which is usually what happens, everyone always dies, uh, you can have the uh, land going to your heirs. Right? A life estate is usually measured by the life of the person who has the estate. You can make it measured by someone else's life. That's completely, you can do that. Um, you can have it measured by a third party's life, right? But once that person dies, you then have it go to someone else, which is what's usually called a remainder, right? When you start with a life estate, there's almost always a remainder following it. I said almost always for exceptions, but usually it's a life estate followed by a remainder. Hmm. Questions? <clears throat> yes, Anna? No, 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 apologize. Okay. Whatever question you have, 10 people have the same question, I promise. So, we said life estate is followed by remainder. That Not is, always, generally. Oh, okay, there okay are exceptions. that's where I was going. So, yeah, there are exceptions, that's for next class. Um, if there's no remainder, O still has the only thing given away was O's interest is called, oh god, you're making me do it. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. O has, <laughs> O has what's called a reversion. You made me do it, I didn't want it, but, but fine. The one minute left. <laughs> it's called a reversion, right? Here, you asked. When there, the future interest after a life estate goes to a third party, it's called a remainder. When the future interest after a life estate goes back to the grantor, it's called reversion. You didn't want that, did you? I'll say it again. When the future interest after a life estate goes to a third party like A or B, you call it a remainder. When the future interest after a life estate goes back to the grantor, it's called reversion. So now we have remainder and reversion. I didn't want to do it, but you made me. Um, at least now your notes are complete. There are lots of words to describe the exact same damn thing, which is why I don't say reverts. Because revert is actually something else. A reverter means something even completely different. So you have reversion and reverter. So the question you asked me was if O gave B your main uh, fee simple, and I said yes, no. And if it's no, then there's definitely not both. So yes, it went to back. Yeah. So. All right, I think I'm out of time. Uh, anything else? You can come up and ask her and ask me some questions if you want, but uh, read carefully for next class. Read carefully. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Oh. Everyone dies though. <laughs> oh. O to A for life. To B for life. A doesn't pay his taxes. Does the lien follow to B? Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you want me to put a pen in it? If, if the state. Right. So if the state 
forecloses for failure to pay taxes, they can only foreclose on A's interest with your life estate. So once A forecloses, the state, the state acquires a life estate measured by A's life. When A dies, it still goes to B, even if the state had done a foreclosure sale. So in other words, when you have a foreclosure sale of a life estate, the remainder man's still waiting. Which is why 